Hello, my fellow gnomes. Welcome back to episode two. Now, you'll see I actually have something that looks a bit more like a train track. Now, don't worry, I haven't secretly done a lot of work here. This is actually the exact same track as in the last video. You see, we've got this track part that's currently transparent. If I turn it back off, you can see it's actually identical. It just has an attachment at the end, the same as this one. What I've just done is I've added all these other parts uh, which neatly fit inside of it to make it semi-translucent. You can see just like that neatly fits uh, inside and it's all in this track model together, which means it's going to look a bit more like a train, but functionally it's exactly the same as this track that we made in the last video. So if we wanted to hook it up onto this new track, well, we would just need to change the attachments on the prismatic constraint over to the track's new attachment like so. But there's a few problems with our setup in the last video. The first thing is that it all relies on a local script. And the problem with that is it means that the player is in full control of what happens, which means our game's not very secure. For example, if a player joins and they're a bad actor, well, they could go and edit our train and they could edit the constraint and just give themselves infinite fuel. They could make themselves go really, really fast even. And that would not be fair on anyone else. And well, they would just be cheating, wouldn't they? So we don't want the client to be able to edit the values of the constraint. So in order to do that, we're going to utilize a server script. So if we go to server script service, add in a script, and we'll call this train handler. And then to communicate between the client and the server, we're going to go to replicated storage, which means it's replicated between the client and the server, and we're going to add in a remote event. In fact, we could even place this event directly inside of the train. It doesn't really matter. Um, but we'll call the, the remote something like uh, throttle because that's what we're going to do. We're going to send from the client uh, how we're pressing the seat throttle. So instead of applying velocity directly, we'll comment that out and we're going to say train dot throttle. Maybe it should be called throttle remote. Throttle remote, and we're going to say fire server, and we'll send the value of seat.throttle. And all this stuff about the speed and the actual velocity is going to be handled by the server. So we can actually comment out um, all of this stuff. We just add two dashes for now. And we're only actually going to need these few lines of code. And then in our server script. We're going to need some variables for the train again. I'm not going to use wait for child anymore because we're in a server script. And then I'm also going to set a driver. Initially, that's going to be equal to nil. Now, because we want to ensure the server is in full control here, we're going to grab the engine and we're going to set it as one thing, the primary part of the model. So select the train model, primary part and select engine. So we've got it selected. And then in our script, we'll say engine set network owner to nil, which will ensure that the server has full ownership. And then we're going to react to whenever anyone enters the train and when any, anyone fires that event. So let's go to the event first, train dot throttle remote dot on serve event, connect that to a function, which will have the player who's sending it and also the throttle value. Now, if that player is not the driver, then we're not interested, right? So if some other random player tries to tell the server how fast they want the train to go, ignore it, right? We don't care. And then we're just going to do the same line that we had in our local script, really, setting the throttle like so. We can just paste that down here. But this time, it's not seat.throttle. It's just the throttle given to us by the client. And then a max speed value that we need to set. So let's put that up here. Local max speed equals 32 again. Now, again, the, we don't want to trust anything coming from the client through a remote event. Uh, so this throttle value, we're going to actually clamp it. Math.clamp. And we're going to ensure that it's between minus one 
and 1, right? They can't send a throttle of 20, for instance. It's got to be somewhere between minus 1 and 1. That's the only values we're going to allow. Now we just need to set who the driver is. So to do this, we're going to connect to our seat and use the get property changed signal type in occupant. Connect that to a function. Now, if there is not a seat dot occupant, right? So if someone's just left the seat, uh, then in that case, we'll set the driver back to nil and we'll just return. We won't do anything else inside this function. Um, but if we have got an occupant, then we need to find out who that player actually is. So let's get the players service at the top of our script. Players, game, get service, players. And now we can use a handy function to say the player is equal to players, get player from character, and the occupant is actually the humanoid value, and the humanoid is inside of our character. So if we do seat.occupant.parent, we will actually get the character, assuming everything's fine. If for some reason we don't have a player, then we'll just exit out, return and end. Um, but otherwise, if we have got a player, then the driver is now equal to that player. Let's play that and see what that looks like. If I now go on my new train track and I start to drive forwards and there we go, we can move the train. Now, you wouldn't normally want to make a vehicle completely server authoritative, such as for a car where there's lots of handling that you want lots of control over. Um, but for a train, it doesn't really matter if there is a slight delay. And so now that the server is in control of all the physics, if we try and go inside of our train and set the properties uh, while we're playing again, let's say there's a uh, some sort of hacker who joined the game and they try to have magically high velocity, well, it's not going to do anything, right? Because the server is in complete control no matter what we do. Great. So that's made it a bit more secure, but what if we want to now go uh, to another piece of track? Well, we're a bit stuck at the moment. This is as far as we can get. So let's copy this track model and we're going to duplicate it, move it forwards. And how do we then switch from one piece of track to the next? Well, to do this, we could probably do with a attachment that actually moves along the track itself. So I like to place um, my dynamic attachments inside of the terrain just to keep them out of the way. So I'm going to add in an attachment and we'll call this train target. Doesn't matter where it's positioned, but by default, it's going to be in the center of the world. Then inside of our script, our train handler on the server, we're going to write some new code that runs every frame. Now, in order to do this, we need to make use of run service. So get service, run service. And then we can get the heartbeat event, every frame after physics, connect that into a function. And that actually gives us delta time, which will be useful. That's the amount of uh, seconds between each frame. And we need to know what track we're currently on. So at the moment, these are just called track model. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to both put them inside of a folder for now. Uh, call this tracks. And then I'm going to number each of them. So the first one is going to be track model one. And then we're going to have track model two. And if I wanted to duplicate this and place another one, that would have to be track model three. And then maybe even I add in, say, a fourth one. I'll use um, Archimedes here to make it a bit easier. And I'm going to add in a little bit of a curve like that, two curved sections at the end there. So back into our heartbeat event, and we can now get the current track. So the track will be equal to the tracks folder. So let's create a variable for at the top. Local tracks equals workspace dot tracks. That, uh, that folder we just created. And so then we can get our individual track from tracks, find first child, and the name of it is track model. And we just need to add on the number of our current track number. So current track number equals one initially. 
and then we'll add to it as we travel. So the next track, piece of track, if it exists, is going to be basically the same thing, but plus one. And then we can monitor the progress of the train along that track by getting the prismatic constraints current position and then dividing that by the size of the track. So track dot primary part. I named track again, but we'll say track dot primary part dot size dot Z. Make sure if these don't that they have a primary part that is set to that track part like that. And before we do anything else, uh, let's just print out that progress so we can see what's going on and we'll re-enable our output. And straight away, see, I've got a little bug. So you've always got to keep your output open. So on line number four, we've got an issue here. Oh, I added in a little minus symbol by mistake. There we go. Take that out. And now we can see we have a really long number, but it's very close to zero. And if we start moving forward in this train, we can see it's going to gradually get up. So now we're 0.1 of the way along the track. And if we keep moving uh, 0.5, so now 50%. And if I just enable the train's uh, prismatic constraint, select it, you can see, there we go. And finally, we reach the end one and we hit the limit and we can't go any further. So what we should probably do is check when we reached near the end of the prismatic constraints limits, we want to switch over to the next one. So we'll hit stop and we're going to add in a little if statement for ourselves. So if that progress, and I don't want to say actually equals one exactly because you might not always perfectly hit it. So we'll just say if it's greater than 0.99 and crucially that the next track actually exists because um, if we're at the very end, then we don't want to keep going or something to break. So if there is a next track, then the current track number, we will add one to it. And now we're going to make use of that attachment we placed inside of the terrain rather than the track itself. So if we go and select our train again, we'll make sure that it's prismatic constraints. Attachment zero point is no longer put inside the track, but the train target. Now, initially, that looks weird because it looks like we're going to go over here and that's not what we want, but we're going to line everything up inside of our script. So let's reference that train target attachment just up at the top. Local target attachment will be equal to, there we go. And then we're going to set the C frame of this, the world C frame, to be exactly that of the attachment within the track. So track dot primary part dot track attachment dot world C frame. Sorry, not track, but next track, because this is if we are going forwards. Um, but otherwise, if we're staying on the same track, uh, then it is going to be our current track like so. So now if we play, uh, our train should have snapped back over onto the correct place. And if I now start moving it forwards, we can start accelerating again. And let's select our train's prismatic constraint so we can see we're now moving along. And when we get to 0.999, we can see it's actually updated to the next section of the track. And if we keep going, so we get to this corner piece, we'll see what happens then. Look, there we go. Our train actually goes round the corner and we switch our attachments position because we're using the train target, which is changing all the time, depending on which piece of track we're on. Now, obviously, we can't actually go backwards properly here. Um, I haven't added any support for that. If you want to be able to go backwards, um, then you can probably figure out the steps you need to take. But of course, inside dead rails, you can't go backwards at all. So we're going to disable it backwards movement entirely. And all we need to do for that is take advantage of the lower limit property of the prismatic constraint. So if we're going to the next track, then the prismatic constraint dot lower limit is going to equal to zero, right? There's no limit. But if we're moving along it, then we're going to set it to whatever our current position is. And we can probably get rid of this progress line and from our local script, we can clean up and get rid of all these bits we commented out since we've now implemented it on the server. 
So now if we play and our train is shot off over there for some reason, I think it's probably a good idea to move our attachment position uh, back where we want it to start off with just to prevent any weird um, havoc kicking in. But there we go. Let's try playing again. And there we go. Our train is now where we expect it to be. And now if we sit on it, we can keep going along. And if any point we try and stop, we can slow down fine. But if we try and go backwards, I can't. And the train's still working fine. It's still connected to the prismatic constraint. But we've just now got a lower limit of exactly 11.784, which is where we currently are. And if we move it forwards a little bit, then you can see those uh, those limits are updating in real time and stopping us from going any further. So we can't go backwards. We don't even have to worry about the next section. So there we go. We now have our tracks turning and we have support for the server. So it's a bit more secure. And we've really got our train going here. If we want to add even more pieces, um, we can do so um, manually for now using a tool like Archimedes or just cloning them in. In future, obviously, we're going to want to generate them a bit more dynamically. Uh, but there we go. That will do for today's video. So thank you very much for watching. If you found it helpful, leave a like, subscribe for the next episode. And you can find all the project files for this video in the Gnome Code Academy available at gnomecode.com. So until then, I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.